Impact of Influence, The Murdoch Family Murders. This is the unfolding story of a powerful South Carolina family, the mysterious deaths they are linked to, and our quest to bring you the truth. Hello, friend. Matt Harris, Seton Tucker, and you can find us on Facebook, Impact of Influence, and today we're talking about judges. Uh, we want you, to, of course, to remember to reach out to us on the Facebook page, also to share the episode and follow, and you can even find us on YouTube, our YouTube channel, Impact of Influence. Look for the link in our Facebook page, and I also want to thank uh, Evergreen. We are now part of the Evergreen podcast team. Uh, joining us, Senator, uh, State Senator Wes Clymer, Republican out of York, uh, District 15, if I'm yeah. right, uh, yeah. which is I should know because it's ours, uh, and uh, serving since 2016, right. I believe. Yeah. Okay. Got, yeah. got, so far, I'm getting things right. You're knocking it out of the park. I am. So far, so good. Watch me fall apart any minute now. Um, and you are fighting hard for judicial reform in this state. So let's start with how it works in South Carolina, as far as picking judges, electing judges, et cetera. Which is way different than how they're elected in, I think, what is it? South Carolina and Virginia are the only, only two, two states. Yeah. So. How does it work? So uh, let's say, Matt, you wanted to be a judge, mm -hmm. right? So you would make an application. It was a lengthy application process. And you send that to something called the Judicial Merit Selection Commission. And the job of the Judicial Merit Selection Commission is, is really quite simple on paper. The JMSC is there to ascertain whether a candidate is qualified or not. And if a candidate is qualified, then the JMSC will send that application on to the full General Assembly. And JMSC is limited to three referrals per, you know, judgeship anytime okay. it sends, a, uh, sends those referrals. So three for one job. It's always Right. So if ten, if 10 people apply, three would be the maximum okay. who could get out, right? Now... JMSC is populated by six legislators, three from the House and three from the Senate, and then four, um, you know, lay members, non-legislators, right? And so the three from the House and the three from the Senate, in the Senate appointed by the Senate Judiciary Committee Chair, in the House appointed by the House Judiciary Committee Chair, and all six of those legislators happen to be practicing attorneys. Okay, right. All right, all right, so bear that in mind, and then... Once um, a nominee makes it out of J the JMSC process, which I hope we get to discuss a little bit more, mm -hmm. some of the yeah. some of the stuff that goes on in JMSC, uh, goes those the nominee goes before the full General Assembly, a hundred and seventy member General Assembly that that House and Senate meet together in joint session, and um, whichever candidate gets eighty six votes first is the winner. Right, so eighty six is a majority, yeah. and that is how judges are elected in South Carolina. So the there's no involvement from the governor, there's no involvement from any executive branch official. The legislature has the sole authority on who gets to become a judge, and importantly, who gets to remain a judge. Oh, okay, so and you brought up the fact that so many of uh, the people on this committee are lawyers, so mm -hmm. there's. A little conflict. Well, just in the legislation alone, that'd be the majority yeah. or a large amount. amount of a little under half of the 170 members of the General Assembly are attorneys. So they, well, I, before I get into why that could be problematic, well, it, compare it is, that to other states. Like, what does it uh, typically happen? Yeah, most states um, operate like most people would be familiar with, with the federal government, where the executive branch, the governor, nominates someone to the bench. And then the General Assembly gives advice and consent on the governor's nominee, right? So mm -hmm. we're familiar with how that works at the federal level. The president right. nominates, and then the Senate offers advice and consent, right? And gotcha. so that is how most states operate. And I think that's really important, um, and that's a model that we should move towards um, because you want three co-equal branches of government, right? Mm -hmm. And right now the judiciary is simply an appendage of the legislature because if – if the General Assembly can hire and the General Assembly can fire, what do you call the person who can hire and fire you? Your boss. That's your boss. <laughs> it's certainly not a co-equal relationship. And ultimately what we're after is to have a co-equal branch of government in the judiciary because you want judges to make decisions on the basis of the law and facts and nothing else. 
Mm -hmm. That is why a co-equal branch of government in the judiciary is important, because you want cases to be decided simply on the law and the facts and not political influence. And we should point out that you're not an attorney. I'm not an attorney. So, I'm, I'm a financial yeah. advisor. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so when when one branch of government, the legislature, populated by nearly you know half of its members being attorneys, right, think about all the different ways that this incentive structure plays out in the in the administration of justice in the state because in, in essence and if, if, even if it's fair it has the appearance of impropriety because you're going a, a judge is ruling on his boss correct if you want to look at right. it that way yeah sure right? so, and, and I, I've, yeah. I've said for years and and i wish i wish it were you know i wish i were joking but i'm kind of joking but the truth is if you ever get in real trouble in this state the best justice money can buy is hiring a member of the Judicial Merit Selection Commission. Mm. Now, is that, is that the kind of world we want to live in? Right. Right? Where th I mean, so think about if you, are, if you and another party are suing one another and you show up in the courtroom and you have a good local attorney you know and trust, and on the other side is a, your, your opposing party has an attorney who's on the Judicial Merit Selection Commission. What do you think the odds are that you're going to get a fair shake from that judge who's mm -hmm. getting ready to have to stand for re-election before the opposing counsel? Well, I think we should also talk about uh, the legislator, legislature immunity that they get as yeah. far as when cases are heard. Oh, this is kind of funny. Yeah, so um, in South Carolina, um, the, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court has issued an order which – um, protects, it's an order of protection, um, and that allows lawyer legislators to not show up for court, delay cases, so long as the General Assembly is in session, and so long as the legislator has something to do that is even tangentially related to service in the General Assembly. And um, so that is how um, lawyer legislators who are defense attorneys, they would say, use, or I would say abuse, that order of protection in order to prevent their clients from ever having to show up in a courtroom. Basically, you got drug dealers all over the state paying lawyer legislators, uh, paying them a retainer fee to continue representing them, and that's how they never go to jail because they never have to go to court because the lawyer legislator keeps telling the judge, sorry, I can't do it today. I got a conference to go to or um a hearing to attend or something like that. Now, is this like what you're saying here? Is this what potentially could happen? Or we have actual cases where this... Right now, to tell me all, but right now today in South Carolina and for many years now, that has been the practice. Okay. And so a couple of years ago, the chief justice under, um, you know, public criticism from folks in the press reversed the order, issue, mm. issued a new order, to, you know, eliminating this order of protection. Within 24 hours, the Chief Justice rescinded his revocation of the order and put it back in place. Hmm. Why? What do you think happened in between the time when Chief Justice Beatty rescinded the order of protection for lawyer legislators and when he reinstated it? He probably had some phone calls. Got some phone calls from lawyer legislators. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. That, that, that just goes to show you how subordinate the judiciary is to the legislature and the degree to which legislative politics interferes in the judicial process. And which, uh, what level of judges does the, uh, the, the legislation take care of? It, does it go all the way down to yeah, magistrates and things like that? Everything. Every, really? Okay. Yeah. And uh, I know that one of the things you're, you're working with is Dick Harpooley and a little bit on this. Yeah. He's a... Uh, uh, a defense attorney. He is a defense attorney. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so who who could have? Um, he's a Democrat and you're a Republican. So right. you're saying yeah. this is probably more of a bipartisan. Yeah. Issue. Good ethics, transparency, and government is not a partisan issue. I mean, there are folks on both sides of the aisle who want to fix this process so that the people of South Carolina have equal access to the justice system. Yeah. You you couldn't snap your fingers and make everything go away. It's going to be take you know. Small steps, I'm sure. Yeah. And so what are, what are some of the first, like, what are the things you want and you think you could accomplish in these small steps? I don't necessarily think the legislature has to take small steps to solve this problem. Oh, really? Okay. Um, and so w there are a lot of different ways you could solve the problem, right? There are a lot of different ways to 
uh, reconstitute the Judicial Merit Selection Commission in a way that mitigates these very obvious conflicts of interest, right? Um, you, my preference would be to hand over the Judicial Merit Selection Commission to the governor because the Constitution states that there must be a JMSC, but it is silent, which means the General Assembly can decide what the JMSC is. There's nothing stopping the legislature from turning the JM, just letting the governor be the JMSC or letting the governor appoint anyone who serves on the JMSC. I mean, that's an, that's an easy, easy and obvious uh, answer. And then the that, other... That could be done on a vote or would that have to be like an amendment? It could just be done by changing the law. Okay. Yeah. And now, I mean, if you you could accomplish this in the form of a constitutional amendment, I mean, that that's possible. A little harder. It requires a two-thirds vote in both houses of the General Assembly. And I think, you know, um, judicial reform would struggle to get a majority vote in the in the general assembly. <laughs> so like two-thirds. Is that right? Yeah, they're, that they're, two-thirds, they're not going to want to vote yeah. for yeah. that The two-thirds process. bar is going to be tough. Yeah. yeah. The uh, One of the things I think I read that uh, Senator Arputlian was talking about was expanding at least, instead of three, yeah. have more. Are you cool with that idea? Yeah, and so um, let, me, let me unpack that thought okay. a, a yeah. little bit more. Yeah. Uh, JMSC's job on paper is sort of to to answer the threshold question is this applicant qualified to serve as a judge does this person possess the the knowledge and intellectual capacity and and ethical you know moorings to adequately serve on the bench that's all JMSC is supposed to do but JMSC does a lot more than that JMSC plays games and those games would include, like, if there are six candidates for a particular judgeship, JMSC knows it can only send three of those nominees or applicants out to the General Assembly. And so what they do, put their thumb on the scale, send out one candidate who is highly, highly, highly qualified, and two who are very obviously problematic for whatever reason with their with their candidates. They just know their person will fly through. Right. And so in that way, the decision about who's going to be a judge is made at the JMSC level instead of before the full General Assembly. Right. And the other things JMSC does is there was a case a couple years ago where a, um, there was a, a civil case involving, I think it was about a $7 million verdict. The verdict came under question. And a lawyer legislator was brought in on the appeal related to the $7 million judgment. The judge rules against the lawyer legislator on this appeal, the judge was at that time running unopposed for re-election to, the, to his seat on the bench. And somehow, JMSC just found that judge unqualified. Hmm. Oh, so and even then, on re-election, they've got to go back into yes, the hopper? Yes, they've got to go back before, right, back okay. before the JMSC. And then that judge who was fired for ruling against a powerful member of the legislature uh, was replaced by a uh, blood relative of that legislator. I think I read that one thing that was one of the. I think it was just crazy talk. Yeah, that's one of the things uh, I think I read. One of the things that would change is the relationship. Uh, yeah, you know, just get that off the board right right away. It seems reasonable. Yeah, um, and so if back to where we were talking about, and I yeah. I know I kind of got expansive on on the answer, but I think it's, no, important, it's great. important to understand. Um, if JMSC were not limited to three then it, doing so would reduce their capacity to engage in mischief. Right. If you're right. putting 10 or whatever, right. five, yeah. six, even, right. you know. Now, that, now, I don't think that that eliminates the mischief. It just moves it to the joint session of the General Assembly, where the lawyer-legislator mischief will continue to, to occur. Right. One thing that, I'm sorry, one thing that brought me, I just, for some reason I wasn't thinking about, was the civil? You brought up the civil, and I, I the whole time I've been thinking criminal. Yeah, but in civil, those attorneys are getting paid handsomely. Very much. Yeah, I, that that for some reason I don't know why that never that the civil part didn't well, jump out at me. Probably more lucrative. Yeah, yeah. I mean, now you've got money and skin in the game, yeah. not just a client. Yeah, which is still. I mean, clients important. Don't get me wrong, but you know, if yeah. you're getting off, uh, if you're, or you're working with somebody who you may even think is innocent, whatever. That's yeah. different than this money game that can be done. Correct. Yeah. There are a lot of legislators making a lot of money as a consequence of this system. Well, I want to get a little bit back into media and also, um, we'll just, we started our podcast with the Murdoch situation Mm -hmm. and we've also, there's been a lot of high profile cases that have made a lot of 
attention in our state, probably, and also national, the Jared Price case and Bowen Turner. And I listened to an interview with Alan Wilson this week where he said, these big cases that have the media attention, those cases don't get swept under the rug. But these cases that don't have the national or you know, statewide spotlight on them are the cases that, that these backdoor deals can happen. Right. When there's no reporter in the room. Right. Then mischief is much easier to accomplish. Yeah. Hmm. And so what would be your goal, your first goal? Because I know that I think I read that you were going to, uh, you would even um, take the, uh, really fight this hard. But I'm not sure exactly what, what do you, what's the main goal of, of, of trying to stop it? Because I don't think you, like you said, are you going to be able to change it completely? Or are you going to be able to get the vote on the governor doing it? Or are you going to take uh, a small, what do you want for smaller steps? What, what's the end so game? I think it's important to understand th- there is no perfect system. This is not a policy question that has a solution. This is a policy question where you have to balance trade-offs. It is impossible to eliminate um, political influence in, a, in an inherently political process. Right. But what you seek to do is mitigate it to the greatest extent possible. That's, that's what we're after here is to reduce the um, manifestation of that inherent conflict of interest in the administration of justice to the greatest extent possible. And again, there are a lot of different ways you can, you can solve for that. There are a lot of different things you could do to mitigate that, that, the presence of that conflict of, of interest. And that's what I'm after. Okay. A, there's never going to be a perfect system. There are always going to be problems. Yes. But every these, state has exactly. issues and yeah. indictments of judges and things like that. Exactly. But our system is, is glaringly broken in a number of clearly visible and fixable ways, let's go after those things. So what, you, I, I think I read you would, you would do a filibuster, a filibuster for this. Would you be saying, like, would you want uh, a new committee set up to study it? Would you want immediate action? What would, what is the, the, would be the immediate goal you would want everybody to vote on or happen? Yeah, so um, again, there are a lot of different ways to fix it, right? Ultimately, I think the best way to fix it is to empower the executive branch with a more meaningful voice in the judicial nominating process. So is that the vote you would want? Yeah, that's the, yes, yes. Okay. I, I've introduced several pieces of legislation to that, too, to that effect. Um, a handful of other senators have done similarly. They, they all you know, differ on the margins, sure. and um, you know, hammering out those differences is... is that's what needs to happen on the Senate floor in January and February of 2024. So your filler buster would would be with a goal of getting a vote on yeah, and the executive that, That's important to um, – all right. So before judicial elections can happen, before that joint assembly of the House and Senate can meet, the House and the Senate have to pass a resolution scheduling those elections. Okay. And the resolution says the uh, joint session of the General Assembly will meet at 12 noon on – February, whatever, to for the purpose of uh, electing judges to these seats. Mm-hmm. That resolution can be filibustered. You vote for it or against it, and it can be filibustered. And what I've said is this system is so broken that I will filibuster that resolution to prevent judicial elections from happening unless okay. until reform is enacted. Gotcha. I saw something, I read something this week about Merle Smith. What, what's happening with that? He said something, he's trying to get something together by February. Did you? Yeah. Um, to, to the speaker's credit, um, Speaker Smith impaneled a, an ad hoc, which is to say not a standing committee, just a, a group of legislators that he appointed to study um, what's wrong with the judicial selection process and to formulate a set of recommendations for the House to consider on how to fix it. Um, fellow York County legislator, Representative Tommy Pope, who's the speaker pro tem, uh, he is the chair of that committee. Another fellow York County representative, Brandon Guffey, uh, serves on that committee with Speaker Pope. And um, the goal is for them to formulate their recommendations by February in order to give the House time to work on them in this upcoming session. So now, you're, yeah, you're, no, so you might to stop the, is, is to stop that from happening before this happens. Correct. Okay, got it. Yeah, and okay. so you know, you might say, and I'll be an eternal optimist. It's great to see progress on this issue, right? 
Uh, but the pessimist might say uh, the legislature has a great and storied tradition of choosing to study something yeah, instead of doing true. something. That, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah right? Yeah. And so it's motion without movement. There's many committees out there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Lots, lots of really, really well done studies collecting dust on bookshelves sure. all over the state. I, 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 based on conversations I've had with representatives Pope and Guffey, I don't think that's what's happening here. Um, but, you know, a, a cynic might say that that's a legitimate thing to be concerned about. Right. Do you feel this has had the most steam and attention than it's had? So you've been there as there's seven years. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you, you feel like this is really the spotlight is on it more than you've seen in the past? Yes, yes, because the um, uh, the, the Murdoch case drew a lot of attention to that. A lot of people came to understand how this system works as a consequence of the uh, notoriety of the Murdoch case. And then there have also been a handful of high-profile incidents around the state where uh, lawyer-legislator conflict of interest yielded judicial outcomes that were just horrible and flagrant, and that has driven public attention towards this issue. And, you know, um, a, a, an elected body standing for election tends to uh, give attention to those things that their voters are asking about. Yeah, and so that's true. kind of where, that's kind of where we are on this right mm. now. Now, you know, of course it wouldn't it, I, you know, as you said before it doesn't solve anything because everything because in some states and I, I don't know if it's all states a uh, senator or somebody could contribute to a judge's fund. Yeah. Say or something like that. Right. right. Yeah, so, yeah, end yeah, around. It's very clear. I, mean, I think the the worst form remember there's multiple different ways to pick judges. The absolute worst form is public elections. Yeah. Because I mean in that case think about I mean, the Supreme Court of the United States has said that that you have a constitutional right to contribute money to political right. advocacy. So then, in in that case, you have law firms setting up super PACs for judges. I mean, that that form of corruption is just broader and more intense than what we have right now. Right, right, right. Right, right. which is you know a localized form of corruption where lawyer legislators are abusing the process. Mm -hmm. A superior alternative to both of those models is the executive branch nominates and the general assembly advi gives advice and consent and the reason why that's a superior method is because you're you know you're, you don't have this sort of fundraising public corruption problem of uh, of elections but you're dividing the the appointment power between two different branches of government and so you know was the absolute power corrupts absolutely the less power that's concentrated in fewer hands yeah the yeah. better off we're going to be sure. at mitigating these conflicts of interest um yeah, that, I mean, it, it all makes sense that at the very least, the the looking like it's inappropriate doesn't doesn't help things either, right? No, you know? It looks yeah. it's it is obviously inappropriate. It, it's just so apparently inappropriate. Yeah. And then you read articles and see examples of of how you know the thing that you kind of intuitively think is inappropriate actually is inappropriate yeah, in right, practice. Yeah. You know, right. there are real-world examples of this going wrong. Um, and how many so, judges, do you know any idea how many judges come through during the course of a year or a month? It, or? it, it varies, um, but I must say normally in the, in, the, in the neighborhood of 30, somewhere okay. around there. Yeah. yeah. Now, because we're talking family court, circuit court, right, that's where's appeals a lot. That's court, wondering. Yeah. Supreme Court from time to time, all that. I just don't think the general citizen who doesn't have any sort of Problems with the law or civil lawsuits, you know, not really. I, I, I was not aware of this problem until recently. So I think that the attention drawn to it is really good. So uh, appreciate you taking time uh, and chatting with us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you have a somewhere you want them to find you online or wherever if they want to look <laughs> Man, for you? My my uh, my. Let's edit that out. <laughs> my website is garbage. <laughs> 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 so look yeah. for you on uh, we'll, we'll, we'll Google you. That out. Google yeah. you somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, Matt Harris, Seton Tucker, Impact of Influence on Facebook page. Rate, share, comment, and all that good stuff. And we'll talk soon, friend.